Well, hello. Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to this dialogue between the three human rights courts in the world. My name is Monica Pinto. I'm a professor at the University of Buenos Aires Law School, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to be the moderator of this dialogue. Uh, as you see, we have here the presidents and judges of the European Court on Human Rights, of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, and of the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Um, the presidents and the judges of the three courts will be just dealing with the impact of COVID-19 coronavirus on human rights. So uh, it is my pleasure to give the floor to the president of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, Judge Elizabeth Odio Benito, who is a Costa Rica national. Jueza Odio Benito tiene la palabra. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and my dear friend, lifelong friend, Monica Pinto. Good day to everyone, to all the judges who are with us this morning, and also to the presidents of the Human Rights Courts. I am here together with the Vice President of the Inter-American Court, Dr. Patricio Pazmiño, uh, for this dialogue, which for the first time we are holding on a, in, on a virtual basis. And I hope it's the last time we need to do this at a distance. The Human Rights Courts of Latin America, Africa, and Europe are here, I, I believe. We, are, uh, uh, we exist in order to give direct testimony, direct witness of our concern and our commitment for what is happening with human rights all over the world uh, as a result of this pandemic. We all know very well what triggered World War II, the Holocaust, the nuclear tragedy, and it, 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 awoke, it, awoke, it awakened hope in our community. We came up, we, we developed the Convention Against Genocide, for example, we started talking about human rights. We believed and still believe that it is through uh, respect for, the, for the equal dignity, equal rights, and freedom from discrimination among all people, that this is the way to achieve justice and peace. In our different parts of the world, therefore, we undertook to adopt instruments addressing these fundamental principles, the Universal Declaration, based in, drawn from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this was the genesis of the, of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, and it also gave rise to the European court. And this was also the genesis of our sister court in Africa, the African court for human rights and human and people's rights. We have been working, we have been contributing uh, opinions and judgments, which are very important for building up uh, dignity and equality for the people in our parts of the world. Unfortunately, today, we are in the midst of a pandemic and it has destroyed lives. It has destroyed social, the social web. It has, in some sense, destroyed and very powerfully destroyed uh, the respect for human rights, respect for the dignity of people, uh, equality, a freedom from discrimination. This pandemic that we are experiencing uh, led our courts to move very quickly to gain an awareness of what was happening and what was going to happen. In our inter-American courts, on April 9th, for the first time in our 40-year history, we adopted a declaration called COVID-19 and Human Rights. And in this declaration, we expressed our 
concern, our alarm, really, uh, in the in the sense that the governments in their and their in their policies should continue to respect human rights as they fight the pandemic. In our declaration, we clearly ex, uh, stated that no public policy should be adopted by any government, whether under emergency powers or not, that did not scrupulously respect dignity of all human beings. And we, and we expressed our concern for violence against women. We already knew at that time that confinement, obligatory confinement in many countries, would produce and has, in fact, led to violence unleashed against women and children, boys and girls alike. Our concern for the losses of freedom, our concern for... Um, uh, for the the disabled, for migrants, for the incarcerated, all of these things. And we gave a very detailed discussion of all the rights that needed to be respected in the framework of the pandemic. Unfortunately, as we said in our declaration, respect for economic and social rights uh, is under threat. And also we expressed our concern for problems of climate change. That is to say, today, The entire human race is facing a pandemic that is destroying lives and personal integrity for millions of people. We are facing a situation of, in, of economic inequality, which has been very clearly highlighted by the pandemic, and it is claiming the lives of workers who, who have lost all their income. It is claiming the lives of women who have fallen into deep inequality. It's also claiming human dignity from millions of people. We are, so what, so what do we do as courts? We're here as presidents to talk about it and to say that we still believe in human rights. We still believe that this is the cornerstone for us to move ahead with this human race and get, and, and get, get through this pandemic that we're all experiencing. And we also know that it is through international cooperation, through multilateralism that led to our existence after World War II and that this is what will lead us out. The human race, human history from the, very, from, from the ancient times has experienced epidemics and pandemics. We have all been looking back at history in recent days. We've seen the Spanish flu. We've been, we've been looking at the, at the Black Plague. We've been looking back at, at many kinds of pandemics that emerged after wars. For example, cholera, which we experienced here in Costa Rica, and which, in fact, destroyed our own society in the 19th century. But we got out of it. We came out of it. And we know we came out of it because human beings know how to come out of it. Women women know how to handle tragedy and I hope my male colleagues will forgive me but better than men we as women have known how to get through it how to get through we have learned from African women or uh, on the um, International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and on the International Criminal Court I learned from them that women know how to take hands with each other, to build a circle. As Isabel Allende said, to put the family in the center in order to protect, to help, to be empathetic and to get through it. This is one of the major contributions that we have given over the course of these two centuries of the struggle against violence. Violence well, violence against women has been around for a very long time, but the testimony that we can give today, the voice that we raise today as courts in order to make our concern much more visible, to make our commitment much more visible, to make our call, of, our, our voice of alert much more, much louder so that public, so that public, authorities, private authorities, and societies as a whole can understand that, in fact, this is a problem that affects everyone. Here in the court, we have held academic activities with support from academics and judges, 
from throughout the continent in order to join efforts, to join our voices. And we want to continue to do that. We want to continue sounding the alarm every day. We do this through our judgments. Most recently, the court also did something absolutely unprecedented. We ordered urgent measures. The president handed down urgent measures to protect the lives and, and safety of migrants in Panama. But sometimes it's not that the states don't want to do it voluntarily. The problem is that they simply don't have the resources, and this is why we need cooperation. This is why we need multilateralism. This is why we need to raise our voices, and we need to continue doing so. Colleagues, presidents of the courts, judges of the courts, Madam Moderator, I know that we can count on one another, all of us. Thank you, Monica. Gracias, Presidenta. Un placer haberla escuchado. Uh, now, you, I, President. it is my pleasure to give pleasure the floor to, to the President of the European Court of Human Rights, Judge Robert Speno. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor. Um, dear President Odio Benito and President Ore, dear judges from the Inter-American Court and the African Court of Human Rights, and my fellow judges that are with me from the Strasbourg Court, Judge Artin Bortsen, elected with respect of Norway, and Judge Seibert Fohr, elected in respect of Germany, are here with me as well. It is my great pleasure to participate in this virtual panel on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on human rights. I would like to begin by thanking most warmly President Elizabeth Odio Benito for her, the timely and important invitation to bring together the three regional human rights courts today. I want to begin by saying that the European Court of Human Rights is committed to strengthening the dialogue between our three courts. I'm delighted to say that we have a number of joint cooperation projects currently in the pipeline. Firstly, we are publishing on the court's website today a dedicated internet page on cooperation between the regional human rights courts. The page will contain the San Jose and Kampala declarations, as well as other relevant information about our judicial and institutional dialogue. Secondly, our three registries are putting together a joint electronic annual report of the leading case law of 2019 which will be published this year. Thirdly, and following on from the first International Human Rights Forum success, successfully organized by the African Court in Uganda in October 2019, the European Court of Human Rights is actively preparing to host the second forum in Strasbourg. This event is scheduled to take place in March next year. We very much hope that the sanitary conditions related to the pandemic will permit delegations of judges from both courts to travel to Strasbourg at that time. However, if this will not be possible, we will certainly maintain our program online as we are doing today. One of the unexpected outcomes of the sanitary crisis is that we have all been for forced to learn to communicate with each other in novel ways. This has occurred on a personal level with family and friends, as well as on a professional level. We are becoming more at ease with virtual meetings and seminars, and as a result, a number of restricted conferences and seminars have been opened up to greater numbers. This, I think, is a positive outcome of the crisis. The topic of our meeting today is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human rights. I would like to salute the very rapid response of the Inter-American Court by way of a statement adopted on 9 April this year, underlining that the problems and challenges encountered by states must be addressed from a human rights perspective with respect for international obligation. The Council of Europe's Gen Secretary General has also issued guidance to governments on respecting human rights, democracy, and the rule of law during, during the crisis. I would firstly suggest that the pandemic has underlined the importance of economic, social, and cultural rights. It has reminded us of the need for solidarity in our communities, of the importance of social safety nets and a well-resourced healthcare system. 
we have realized that the younger generation needs stable and secure employment and opportunities for the future. We have all appreciated the cleaner air and reduction in pollution in our cities during lockdown periods. The right to a clean environment seems more pressing than ever. Of course, the pandemic has put pressure on member states to fulfill their positive obligations to protect life and health. There exists consequently the risk of the pandemic being used, and I want to stress this point in our debate, being used as a pretext for abusing public power, imposing measures on the populace, which although intuitively persuasive in the face of an unprecedented threat to human life and well-being, is upon a closer look, a manifestly disproportionate overreach which threatens the fundamentals of democratic life, societies governed by the rule of law and the protection of human rights. I think we can all agree here that balance is key. I have in speeches that I have given since I began my mandate six weeks ago, distilled four general and fundamental principles which are important for convention-based challenges in the era of the pandemic. Firstly, the public interest, whilst undoubtedly important, cannot be an absolute trump card for national authorities in the fight against the pandemic. The convention requires proportionality, a balance to be struck between the public interest and the autonomy of the person. The responsibility for striking that balance is at the outset for the national authorities. In short, the convention requires all national authorities, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches to engage with the principle of proportionality in good faith. Secondly, the principle of legality, based on the primordial principle of the rule of law that permeates the convention, will become ever more salient when lockdowns, restrictions on freedom of movement, and other such measures are imposed. The principle of legality requires that measures taken at national level are accessible and foreseeable. This precludes vague and overbroad rules that run the risk of unpredictability and arbitrariness in their, in, in their enforcement. Thirdly, rules adopted at national level as, as a basis for pandemic related measures restricting individual rights must not afford excessive discretion to the executive. In a true democracy, the executive must not be the sole arbiter of what rules are applicable. The democratically elected legislator must be reactive and up to the task of engaging with the difficult balancing of interest required in this field. Fourthly, the adoption of emergency laws or declarations deviating in general from convention guarantees must be strictly tailored to meet the exigencies of the situation. As I speak, 10 member states have derogated from the convention under Article 15 and emergency laws in this new paradigm should not become the new normal. Judge Saeed Ford will discuss the issue of Article 15 and declarations or derogations from the convention in more detail in a moment. What is absolutely clear is that the values of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, as safeguarded by our three regional courts, are as important and relevant as they have ever been, indeed, perhaps even more so. Before I conclude, allow me now to mention or provide you with some information on how the work of the court has progressed during the lockdown here in France, which uh, varied just from the middle of March up until uh, just before middle of May. Let me mention three information uh, elements here for you to consider. The Grand Chamber, uh, Chambers, Committees and Single Judges continue to examine cases by way of a written procedure. All of us judges, we were confined, of course, as other citizens in our homes, but we continued to work uh, uh, electronically deciding cases as we had done before, although inhibited by uh, the lack of face-to-face interaction. 
During the period between 16 March and 10 May, more than 5,400 applications were processed by the court. As a result of this activity, the total stock of pending cases has remained stable. Secondly, the court delivered 86 judgments electronically and 180, 128 decisions, including one grand chamber decision during this period. 3,819 single judge cases, which were adopted between 16 March and 7, 7 May were notified after 10 May. Thirdly, moreover, in accordance with a business continuity plan established before the lockdown period in France, the court was able to process all requests for urgent interim measures received under our provisional measures provision, Rule 39 of the Rules of Court. Judge Borsen will discuss this provision in more detail in a moment. We did this through the establishment of a special Rule 39 teams, notwithstanding a substantial increase in such requests from different states where vulnerable committees were at particular risk from COVID-19. One of my biggest challenges when I took up the new position as president on 18 May was to take a position on how we would deal with our grand chamber cases. We could have taken a position that because of the pandemic, we would delay the hearing of grand chamber cases until the situation uh, remained or would become more stable. We did not do that. We considered it our obligation to continue to deliver justice in a manner as uh, expeditious as possible. We therefore decided in an unprecedented manner to conduct three grand chamber hearings in June by video conference. Now, what that meant was that the government and applicants, and even in one case, third party interveners, were all linked to the court, to the grand chamber hearing room by video conference set up, organized and prepared by the IT department of the court in association with a, an outsourced firm. I can tell you this was not an easy undertaking. It was uh, technologically difficult to organize, uh, both for the president of the court and for my colleagues in the IT department. There were sleepless nights, but it went extremely well. And I must say we are all proud for having undertaken uh, uh, those proceedings because it means that in difficult cases in relation to uh, rights of foreigners, in relation to uh, other issues, for example, like domestic violence, we will be able to render judgments uh, in a more shorter space of time than would have been the case if we would have said that the pandemic would uh, close down proceedings for us or halter uh, limit our ability to function. So with those words, uh, Madam Professor, uh, dear judges, uh, again, let me thank you very much for organizing this uh, virtual conference, which brings us together in a precarious time and hopefully inspires us and motivates us to move forward together in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President Spano. Uh, now it is my pleasure to, to give the floor to the President of the African Court on Human and People's Rights, Judge Sylvia Auré. Monsieur President Auré, vous avez la parole. I will talk about the impact of COVID-19 on human rights uh, from the perspective of the African Court of Human and People's Rights. Crisis and human rights have a dialectical uh, relationship, at least this is how I see it. Human rights are often born in the context of a crisis. Uh, we should only have to think uh, about the unrest armed conflicts uh, that preceded the French Declaration of 1789 and the American Declaration of 1776. The enshrinement of human rights uh, in positive law has, uh, all, uh, has always followed this type of events and constitutes a promise uh, for the future. In Africa, the context of violence and the resistance to it was the decisive element uh, to adopt the Charter. 
that is uh, the uh, same observation made by Mr. Denny Segi, who, recalling the suffering of the Central African Equatorial Guinean and the Ugandan peoples uh, during the second decade of independence, states that, uh, I quote, the reaction of the African peoples uh, to repression as well as the repulsion felt by the leaders faced with these horrors raise awareness about the need for regional protection of human rights, end quote. It is by the same effect that crises threaten uh, human rights established by positive law. The crisis linked uh, to the appearance of COVID-19 uh, confirms this global trend. Observations made by the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights are the same um, in Africa regarding access to healthcare, the Legion of Declarations of State of Emergency, housing, the situation of vulnerable people, access to and management of information, displaced persons, and respect for privacy, just to name a few. Even if at first glance, uh, the magnitude of COVID-19 may increase considering its, its importance, its grave consequences in terms of loss of lives, the exceptional public danger it poses, the legal challenge it implies, all raise questions of both reasons for restrictions and derogations of uh, human rights. Many international conventions uh, related uh, to human rights contain derogation clauses. Such is the case of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which in Article 4 states, quote, in time of public emergency which threatens the life of the nation and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, the state parties of the present, uh, to the present covenant may take measures uh, derogating from their obligations under the covenant to the extent <clears throat> strictly required by the exigencies of the situation, provided that such measures are not inconsistent with their uh, other obligations under international law and do not involve discrimination solely on the ground of race, color, sex, language, religion, or social origin. There are no provisions in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights that establish the possibility of derogation. It, in its decisions relating to Communication 55 uh, of 91, International Pen Against Chad, the International Commission on Human Rights confirms this exclusion in the following terms. Unlike other human rights instruments, the African Charter does not allow for state parties to derogate from their treaty obligations during emergency situations. Thus, even a civil war in Chad cannot be used as a cause by the state violating or permitting violations of rights in the African Charter. Um, then should it be inferred that any derogations e are prohibited at the risk of also exposing the state that guarantees the human rights uh, to disappear? Referring to Fatsa Ogergus, uh, Frederick Sucre states that the power to derogate seems to be regulated by international law. Uh, it is the regime of restrictions that should be referred to in order to assess uh, the, prospect, uh, the prospects for judicial restriction uh, to the consequences of COVID-19, particularly the matter of the proportionality of state measures. Human rights conflicts may arise uh, that might, might be also added to this. On the matter of restrictions, uh, the base for the restrictions regime of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights is Article 27, under which each individual has duties towards the family and the society towards the state and other re legally recognized communities and the international uh, community itself. This article also states that the rights and freedoms of each person are exercised respecting the rights of others, collective security, morals, and the common interests. The Article 27 uh, um, uh, must be read in conjunction with Article 60 which is unique in its kind and allows African protection bodies to draw inspiration from human rights, people's rights, including provisions of various African instruments, 
related to human and people's rights provisions of African uh, from the African uh, Union Charter, the United Nations Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, provision of others uh, instruments adopted by the United Nations and by African countries in the field of human and people's rights, as well as provisions from uh, the different uh, specialized agencies uh, of the United Nations of which the state parties are members. And the court, the African court, has built up case law uh, on that regard. Um, although Article 27 is presented as a general limitation clause that, that has no control without control, African jurisprudence has uh, attached uh, proportionality requirements to it. The African court has crystallized its jurisprudence on the matter in Taganyika Law Society, the Legal and Human Rights Center, and Reverend Christopher uh, Miklika v. Uh, Tanzania uh, of uh, judgment of 2013. Uh, this case uh, recalls that the jurisprudence regarding the restrictions on the exercise of rights have, uh, has developed the principle that the restrictions must be necessarily uh, necessary in a democratic society. They must be reasonably proportionate uh, to the legitimate aim pursued. Once the complainant has established that there is prima facie a violation of a right, the respondent state may ar argue that the right has been legit legitimately restricted by law. By providing the evidence that the restrictions, the restriction serves uh, one of the purposes that are set out uh, in Article 27 of the Charter. In various communications of 93, 94, and 96 that were consolidated under uh, the name Media Rights Agenda and others against Nigeria, and uh, a, a judgment of 2002 um, under the name Garrett Amber Prince uh, against South Africa, South Africa, the Commission has stated that the only legitimate reason for limitations of the right and freedoms of the African Charter are found in Article 27 of the Charter. After assessing whether the restrictions are, are affecting, the restriction is affected through uh, a law of general application, the Commission applies the proportionality test in terms of which it weights, it weights the impact, nature, and extent of the limitation against the legitimate state interest serving a particular goal. The legitimate interest must be proportionate with an absolutely necessary uh, necessity for the advantages uh, which are to be obtained. After having referred to the jurisprudence of the European Court and the Inter-American Court, uh, the, the African Court of Human Rights, of Human and People's Rights, concludes that it agrees with the African Commission that the limitations to the rights and freedoms of the Charter are only those set out in Article 27 of the Charter and that such limitations must be must take the form of a law of general application. And this must be proportionate to the legitimate aim pursued. Not without recalling that the European Court of Human Rights has adopted the same approach, which requires a fair balance to be achieved between the demands of the general interest of the community and the imperatives of the protection of the fundamental individual rights. For the other cases of restrictions for which the court, um, uh, for which uh, some limitations are pro pro provisioned in the text, the court, while recognizing the states have a margin of appreciation, uh, subjects uh, the acts of the state uh, to a test of proportionality. This has been illustrated uh, with regard to freedom of expression, one of the most threatened rights during this uh, time of COVID-19. In the Lohe Isa case, uh, the court held that the limitation must be serve, uh, must serve a legitimate a a purpose and that in order to be acceptable, it is not enough for the law to establish a restriction and for it to be written precisely. It must also serve a legitimate purpose. The court considered, just like the Commission, that the possible reasons for limitations must be based on legitimate public interest and the inconvenient caused by the re these restrictions 
should be strictly proportionate and absolutely necessary for the benefits to be realized. The Commission draws legitimate grounds uh, from Article 27, namely uh, that the rights shall be exercised with due regard to the rights of others, collective security, morality, and common interests. For these legitimate purposes, the Court borrows sections A and B of, uh, par uh, of paragraph 3, Article 17 of the Covenant, specif uh, specifically the uh, protection of national security, public order, public health, or morals. According to the court, the respondent state has not demonstrated that the financial penalty, as well as the suspension uh, for six months of the weekly, were necessarily to protect the rights and reputation of the prosecutor of the Republic of Burkina Faso. And the court concludes that all, this, uh, all the sentences pronounced by the High Court and confirmed by the Court of Appeal of uh, Urgadou were disproportionate uh, to the uh, objectives pursued by the relevant provisions of the Information Code and the Penal Code of Burkina Faso. In the case of Umohosa uh, against Rwanda uh, of 2017, the court recalls that the right to freedom of expression is one of the most fundamental rights uh, protected by international human rights law. It requires states uh, to protect uh, these rights from restrictions made by individuals or by governments. While acknowledging, acknowledging that this right is not unlimited, in the present case, the court recognized that given the margin of appreciation of the respondent state in defining and proscribing certain criminal acts in its domestic legislation, the law provided sufficient guidance to enable individuals to adopt their behavior to these rules. Therefore, the court considered that the aforementioned laws fulfill the requirement of being a law as set out in Article 9 of the Charter and that the restriction of, on freedom of expression of the applicant has served uh, the legitimate interest of protecting national security and public order. Consequently, it had to be subject, uh, subjected to the uh, proportionality test. In this regard, the court considers the particular context in which the incriminatory statements were made. Um, the court uh, considered that the conviction and the sentence imposed uh, on the applicant for having made those statements at the Giga, uh, Kigali Genocide Memorial and on other occasions were not necessary in a democratic society. And that even if the court admitted that it, uh, it was necessary to impose restrictions on those statements, the sentence imposed on the applicant was not proportionate uh, to the legitimate objectives uh, that the conviction and the sentence sought to achieve. In this regard, the court pointed out that the respondent state could have adopted different, less restrictive measures to achieve the same objectives. Um, such could be the prospect for judicial treatment of COVID-19 without prejudice uh, to conflicts with other human rights, such as, for instance, the right to health. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président uh, Thank you so much. Um, we will follow with the, the presentation by Judge uh, Anya Seibert Fu, uh, who is a judge at the European Court on Human Rights. Judge Anya, you have the floor. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, Monica, thank you very much. Uh, I will speak in English. Um, first of all, I would like to wholeheartedly thank President uh, Elizabeth Udio Benito for giving us the opportunity for this exchange, which I find very, very pertinent. As you have elaborated, all our regions are confronted with challenges that we haven't seen since the Second World War. And therefore, I think it's very important, as you said, to enhance multilateralism and also cross-regionalism in order to uh, join forces in uh, protecting human rights. Now, uh, I was asked by our President Spano to talk a little bit about derogations because there have been very different reactions in Europe towards the crisis and how to deal with the crisis in adopting measures which have restricted the enjoyment of human rights. Now, let me start 
uh, my presentation by citing uh, a well-known um, theorist uh, from Germany, Karl Schmidt, whom you may know, who lived in the 20th century and uh, dealt excessive, uh, uh, substantially with constitutional theory. He said, sovereign is he who decides on the exception. Now, we have an exception role in our convention, as you also have in Article 15 of the European Convention, which provides for the opportunity for states to make derogations under the convention. So far, we have seen, as uh, pointed out by Judge, uh, Spano, President Spano, we have seen 10 derogations, um, which have been notified to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Um, all 10 derogations out of 47 member states of the Council of Europe were relying basically on pronouncements by the WHO. Now, it's interesting to see that um, most of them have already also made derogations under the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, except of three. Now, what was the subject? The subject was mainly regarding the right to privacy, the right to freedom of assembly, the right also to property and education because of the um, closing of the schools, and um, also with regard to the right to liberty, freedom of movement, and due process. This is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the major, these are the major subjects, but you see differences between the different states. Uh, some states um, have not even specified specific uh, uh, provisions of the convention with regard to the derogations. Interesting enough, as you, if you will see the list of uh, the states who have derogated from the convention, you will see that these are mainly Central European and Eastern European countries. Now, perhaps I should add that there was a big um, discussion in Europe, starting in, in early March, about derogations and what would be the best way. A lot of countries, 37, have decided not to derogate from the convention, um, like, for example, Spain, Italy, France, Germany, England, and so on and so forth. Um, as I said, uh, even in academia, there were a lot of um, different views. Um, some said it was um, important to have derogations in order to show that states were still abiding by the convention, but they were trying to make a commitment. Other thought thought that this may be detrimental um, because it may, in a way, lead to uh, a kind of being overly differential if um, no kind of reservations are made. I don't, I won't comment on this, but I, I would like to explain why we have this variety of different reactions, um, despite the fact that uh, you can see that a number of countries have adopted very similar measures in response to COVID. Now, most of these uh, derogations have already been uh, withdrawn uh, um, by uh, several states. There are rest only, to my knowledge, four states where um, the derogations are still ongoing. However, on the premise that there's a regular check. So um, the states have regularly notified the Council of Europe about the need to prolong this, um, the situation, the emergency situation or not. Um, uh, one is about to end in Armenia. Most of them, as I said, were withdrawn in, starting in mid-May. Now, um, uh, the court has dealt with uh, derogations before, mainly in the context of the Ni Northern Ireland conflict, which was basically about terrorism prevention uh, and terrorist threat. And um, there are some very prominent um, cases, lawless case, Ireland versus UK case, and so on and Brannigan, where the court has elaborated a set of um, um, uh, basic criteria how to interpret Article 15 in order to make sure that it doesn't give carte blanche to the states. And um, the court, though having recognized that states have a certain margin of, or a wide margin of appreciation, it is not without any kind of control. So uh, basically, ultimately, it is the task of the European Court of Human Rights to make the determination on Article 15. Um, and it will take into account, for example, the nature of the threat, but also the, slim, the, the scope of the, the derogation and the basic safeguards against abuse. Now, these are all cases 
that I cannot pronounce on right now. These will be cases for the future for the court to decide. I think we will have to deal with cases which uh, raise issues about derogations. But as you see, since a lot of states have not made derogations, we will also see a lot of cases um, which, um, which operate under the normal convention. Whether there's a big difference, I leave it to you to decide. If you look to the rights that have been derogated from, you will see that all these rights are not absolute. And for example, the freedom of assembly um, and other rights um, can be limited for public health um, purposes and in the interest of protecting health. Now, coming back uh, to what um, Carl Schmidt said, um, sovereign is who, who decides on this exception. I would say that in states of the rule of law and the, the, Europe, the Council of Europe is based on the rule of law and democracy. It's ultimately the court and the courts in the domestic countries, which will make this decision. For this purpose, as uh, judge, uh, uh, um, the, the three presidents have already pointed out, proportionality and predictability are very important safeguards. And so we will make these kind of decisions ex post facto, so only in the future. I think this also may already have excellent implications. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Judge uh, Seibert Four. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Judge Stella Anukam from the European, the African Court on Human and People's Rights. You have the floor, Judge Anukam. Thank you, moderator. You're doing a good job. And a good afternoon, the presidents of the courts and my colleague judges. I'm also in, delighted to be a part of this dialogue which is very apt at this time. Um, the topic for discussion is the impact of COVID-19 on human rights, the perspective of the three human courts, human rights courts of the world. By way of introduction, uh, which we already know, but uh, permit me to state that the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a massive amount of disease, Death and despair troubling the entire world and posing a formidable threat to the enjoyment of human rights around the globe. The pandemic itself and many of the measures taken to end it has seriously threatened or affected the enjoyment by billions of people across the world of the human rights to health, to life, education, food, shelter, work, freedom of movement, liberty, and freedom of assembly, including harm to the enjoyment of the right to development and democracy, and to freedom from discrimination and gender-based violence, especially in my part of the world, rape. There has been an increase in, the, in cases of rape even rape of minors. <laughs> and I think the president of the Inter-American Court alluded to the gender violence that we are experiencing at this time. What can be done? To face COVID-19, the human rights community must consider the protection of its workers a top priority. In the African Court, for example, last, last month, we lost a staff, actually our receptionist, I mean, has so rest in peace. The need to strengthen social protection measures in our courtrooms and premises cannot be overstated. In the face of the pandemic, governments are expected to ensure that they do not interfere directly or indirectly with the right to health of the people. States should refrain from denying or limiting access to healthcare services marketing unsafe drugs, unsafe kits, imposing discriminating practices relating to health, health status and needs, withholding, censoring, or misrepresenting healthcare information, and from infringing on the basic human rights of people as recognized under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
The International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights require, amongst others, for state parties to take steps to achieve the full realization of the rights by doing all to prevent, treat, and control the epidemic, occupational and other diseases as well. It also requires the creation of conditions which would assure access to all medical services and medical attention in the event of sickness through prompt warnings addressing the prevention, treatment, and the control of the, of the pandemic. Over policing by security and over zealous police officers, as, as we witness in some parts of Africa, is not the answer to COVID-19. A punitive approach to a public health crisis is not necessary. It is indeed uncalled for. The populace should rather be enlightened and made to understand the new normal to protect our collective right to health in the current pandemic situation, we need to balance our individual rights with the collective responsibilities. The African court perspective. What we have done here is to examine the number of applications we have received within the period of the pandemic, which is March to July this year and compared to, this, to this, uh, the number of applications received about the same time last year. And, we are, and the conclusion we arrived at was that the figures, because in between July, between March and July 2019, we had about 14 applications, we received about 14 applications, whereas between march and july 2020 we have received only four applications during this the period under consideration and from what from the comparison we have made the figures cannot establish that the african court saw an increase of incoming applications due to covid-19 pandemic the most likely explanation may be that either potential cases are being put together and we reach the court later in the year. Or the possible COVID-19 related violations have not been significant to warrant litigation before the African court. Even more likely is the time it may take for preliminary condition of exhaustion of local remedies to be met in many of the cases as a basic requirement under articles 56.5 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. A recent virtual seminar organized by the International Commission of Jurists has revealed that there has been significant litigation before domestic courts on COVID-19 related violations, especially due to the implication of anti-COVID-19 measures and restrictions on limitation or restrictions or limitations on the rights of the African Charter. So as a court, we expect that in the nearest future, we'll have a lot of um, um, cases of alleged violations arising from the pandemic. But as of today, we may not, that may not be a quick conclusion to arrive at. Then we also have looked at the applications that relate, that we have received recently, that relate directly to, the, to COVID-19. And we did a thorough examination and we brought out three, three applications involving three countries. And in those cases, we observed that the applicants did not allege violation of rights protected in the African Charter in relation to COVID-19 or measures implemented by state to fight the pandemic. In the first two cases, the applicants rather made a request for expedited examination of cases that has been pending before the courts. They allege that their health deteriorated during this their incarceration and that the court should expedite consideration of their cases because their conditions could be worsened by the pandemic, being in prison. The court is yet to make a ruling on the request, but the, the status of the court 
do not include provision on expedited consideration of application, as opposed, for instance, to the ECOWAS court, which has made in its protocol and rules such provision. However, the court has in practice and so motto, using its discretionary, discretionary power and in the interest of justice, made an indirect application of the procedure of expedited consideration of cases. It has, for instance, decided to examine and deliberate on newer cases in priority, newer cases in priority based on on the urgency, the situation of the applicants, the nature of the case, the maturity of the proceedings, and the readiness of the case. In any event, in such practices, the court has always considered prioritizing matters on a case-by-case -case basis. For instance, to avoid creating a situation of unfairness where some applicants are given priority in the consideration of their applications, the court will very likely ensure that evidence is adduced to prove how COVID-19 pandemic and the measures arising therefrom affects the applicants in the particular circumstances of the case. The court also recently received a request for advisory opinion in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis. The authors aver specifically that the political, economic, and social crisis wrought upon Africa and the rest of the world by the COVID-19 pandemic poses a challenge for democratic governance, the rule of law, and the promotion and protection of human and people's rights. There are 22 a United, uh, African Union member states that have scheduled to hold presidential or legislative or local government elections in 2020. At least 11 of these elections are for the position of president or prime minister. And then we wonder, will these elections hold in the light of COVID-19? The author also submits that while the rescheduling of national election is a matter of, of sovereignty within the domestic jurisdiction of every state party, the conduct of election, nevertheless, is a matter of continental treaty law affecting the, the exercise of human rights to effective participation in government, as well as standards of good governance now accepted in treaty law by African states. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the AU member states have mostly taken measures that have had the practical effect of limiting some rights in order to guarantee the right to life. These measures have affected the enjoyment of basic rights, such as the right to freedom of movement, assembly, association, and information and also the rights of citizens to effectively participate in the governance of their respective countries. Especially, and although not limited, through regular, free and fair election. The issues the court will be considering will be whether the, the court can be seized with the question, can, the issues before the court will be safeguarding the right to participate in government under under the relevant articles of um, of the the relevant treaties as affected by the COVID nineteen crisis. Another issue would be whether the African court cannot interpret and lay down in terms of treaty law applicable to state parties standards for conducting elections during or or during or affected by the COVID-19 crisis. The author has requested further that if either or both of the above questions are resolved in the affirmative, the African court is invited to further dispose of the following questions. What, if any, are the, applic are the applicable obligation of state parties for ensuring effective pro protection of citizens' right to participate in the government in the context of an election held during dependency of a declaration of a public health disaster or emergency, such as the COVID-19 crisis, in light of the express provisions of Articles 1 and 13 of the African Charter and other articles of similar treaties. 
Secondly, what, if any, are the legal standards founded in treaty law applicable to state parties that choose to conduct elections vis-a-vis -vis member states that choose not to conduct elections during dependency of the COVID-19 disaster or emergency measures? And thirdly, what, if any, are the legal standards applicable to states precluded by reason of a public health emergency such as the one caused by COVID-19 pandemic from organizing elections as the basis of the democratic mandate of government. These are the kind of issues the African court will begin to consider arising from COVID-19 vis-a-vis human rights in the continent. I would like to take us through some internal measures that the court has taken since the, um, the occurrence of the COVID-19. As at the 20th of March 2020, the court suspended its 56th ordinary session that was due to end on the 27th of March 2020 to protect the judges as well as the staff of the court. On the 4th of May 2020, the judges of the court met at a visual meeting to discuss the impact of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic on the work of the court and the measures put in place to ensure safety of staff and business continuity of the court. During its virtual meeting held on the 14th of May 2020, the court decided to suspend all the time limits that are currently in progress before this court from 1st of May to the 31st of July 2020, inclusive the suspension of time limits the, however, the suspension of time lim limits do not apply to requests for provisional measures. The registry has also issued four advisory memos illustrating measures proposed to improve the safety of staff, with each memo proposing further measures to improve this, the safety of staff. The measures initiated included social distancing, wearing of masks at the court premises and outside the office, Rush, rat, 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 okay, rotational working for office for from office for essential staff. So if you are not, there was a kind of um, a roster where you know when you should come to work and when you should not come. So everybody not at work at the same time. Also, um, a warning to staff to seek medical guidance from the doc from the court doctor when feeling ill and recommendation for staff not to travel out of the country or out of Arusha without notifying the registrar or the, the, uh, the, the doctor of the court. There was yet a fourth memo which instructed that from, with effect from the 1st of June, 2020, all staff work from home with the exception of the president, the deputy registrar, the heads of division, medical and security units as demanded by the exigency of their work. The court has also provided a methodology for considering judicial matters, prioritizing those that are considered very urgent. The court has also provided a methodology for rendering judgment virtually. We have also, as a court, suspended internship for now. There has been digital, digitalization of case filings. And the court conducted his first visual court session, which is the 57th ordinary session last month from the 1st to the 26th of June. The judgments after that um, session were delivered virtually, of course, and they were live streamed on YouTube. Despite this constraint, the court still operated effectively and delivered seven of such judgments. And um, as I said, they, they, were, they were live streamed on YouTube. What are the impacts on the court statutes? The court has, had commenced a revision process of its rules of procedures prior to the occurrence of the pandemic. However, during its 57th ordinary session, the COVID-19 session, the court adopted and incorporated in its new rules of procedure several rules in, in light of the occurrence of the pandemic, mainly to cater for special 
or emergency circumstances such as COVID-19 pandemic and any other one that may arise in future. The same, we did the same regarding our practice direction. There was cause for us to also um, um, revise our practice direction in light of the pandemic. So the, these instruments of the court now include several related provisions, such as provisions on electronic filing, visual sessions and hearings in the 2020 practice direction. We also now have a new, a new rule on force majeure in our 2020 rules of procedure. In conclusion, permit me to conclude by quoting from the statement of the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, at the 43rd regular session of the Human Rights Council, where he launched his call for action for human rights. He said, we are all in this together. The best response is one that responds proportionately to immediate threats while protecting human rights and the rule of law. This virus threatens everyone, human rights, uplifts everyone. By respecting human rights in this time of crisis, we will build more effective and inclusive solutions for the emergency of today and the recovery of tomorrow. I thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Judge Anukam. Uh, it has been a pleasure listening to you. Um, it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Judge Austin Borton of the European Court on Human Rights. You have the floor, Judge. Madam Speaker, Presidents, Judges, colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, and having our successful meeting in Kampala freshly in mind, I'm happy to see you all. Uh, and I'm also grateful to having been able to participate here, uh, listening in to your insightful and inspiring interventions, which I find truly demonstrates the value of us, the International Human Rights Court, coming together for what we can call a dialogue, and also in, in order to support each other and inspire each other. As announced by President Spano, I will address a rather specific issue, uh, namely what we call Rule 39 in the Rules of the Court, and just you know, to, to place this into the framework, I will just cite the most important part of that rule. Namely, it says that the chamber or the president of the section or the duty judge may at the request of a party or of any other person concerned or of their own motion indicate to the parties any interim measure which they consider should be adopted in the interest of the parties or of the proper conduct of the proceedings. It should be noted that this Rule 39 is not a part of the Convention as such. It is a creation of the Court and its efficiency is indeed dependent on the Member States' good faith. However, experience shows willingness among the Member States to accept the Court's decisions under this Rule 39 and I think we have to admit that the success lies mainly in the mutual understanding that Rule 39 will only be applied in exceptional circumstances in respect of the principle of subsidiarity. In general, the court follows a very stringent and strict practice, rejecting or refusing most requests. The court receives approximately 1,000 500 requests every year, and only 10% are granted. Moreover, the object of an interview measure is to maintain the status quo pending the court's determination of the substance of the complaint. For example, typically not to execute a decision to extradite an applicant, alleging that there is a real risk that he or she will be treated inhumane upon arrival to the receiving country. Requests under Rule 39 are normally decided within the time frame of a couple of days by one judge only. 
Exceptionally, the request will be decided by a chamber, but this will only happen in cases that are particularly sensitive or raise principled questions as to the application of the convention or of rule 39 itself. And in any event, the procedure is purely written. According to well-established practice at the court, a request for an interim measure will normally only be accepted if the case relates to Article 2, which is the protection of life, or Article 3, the prohibition of torture, inhuman or degrading treatment. And in addition, that the applicant faces an imminent danger, an imminent danger for irreversible damage to his life or health. We can also see that exceptionally, Rule 39 has been considered applicable also in rel relation to fair trial guarantees under Article 6 of the Convention or Article 8, which is the protection of private and fam family life and the home. The court has been able to deal with requests under Rule 39 in a timely and adequate manner, even during the lockdown as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here I, I think it's necessary to stress as a matter of the court, uh, any court's role during such a crisis to underline that the court is there, that the court is operating and that the court is still prepared to perform the, the scrutinies, the, the, the control with the other parts of the government that is needed. And of course, being able to deal with urgent matters in a timely manner is, in, is decisive in that respect. So this has been, I think, a very important part of uh, the priority in the court that we will be able to continuously to deal with these cases. And the court has received uh, approximately 220 the request for interim measures uh, directly affiliated with the COVID-19 pandemic, in addition to, let's say, the more regular ones. Uh, and this has been in particular from prisoners and refugees requiring that states initiate measures, of course, to protect them from being infected. Uh, these have been mostly related to Greece, Italy, France, Turkey, the UK and Spain. And also, of course, measures as to providing with care should that be needed. Uh, it is a basic principle before the court that each uh, applicant, of course, and each application is assessed on an individual basis. But however, it is a clear pattern in these cases that these requests in general have been rejected unless the applicant has been able to show that he or she for some reason are particularly vulnerable. Particularly vulnerable. Often that would be asylum seekers in hotspots, unaccompanied minors, persons with serious health problems and pregnant women. Uh, most of these requests relate to individual situations. However, the court has also been asked to intervene by the use of Rule 39 regarding measures of a more general measure, general nature relating to the fight against the COVID-19. And important examples here would be the closing down of the Spanish city Madrid or ports in Italy and Malta. And again, of course, all such requests will be assessed individually, but also here we can see a very clear pattern, namely that the court has so far rejected all these requests uh, for the court to intervene uh, towards general measures taken by the member states. Uh, to the effect that the court has thus, I would say, avoided taking an active part in domestic policy making as to the fighting of the disease. And this brings me to the end of my very short intervention. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Judge uh, Borsen. And uh, uh, just to close 
of the presentation by the judges. It's my pleasure to give the floor to Judge Pazminio, the Vice President of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Pues Pazminio tiene usted la palabra. Good morning. It's truly a pleasure to be with all of you once again in this encounter. So thank you for accepting our invitation to take part. I want to move along directly to the subject at hand in this conversation. I want to talk about the impact of, of, of COVID on human rights and some of the perspectives that we need to contend with in this intercourt system as we address the pandemic. We are facing a, an unprecedented global and regional crisis as a result of the appearance of COVID-19. If we could summarize a sentence that expresses the widespread feelings that, that we're seeing in the media, in the traditional and social media, almost all agree that nothing will ever be the same. In the post-pandemic, everything will need to change. However, we cannot expect to live in a world the same as it was before. And we are all certain that whatever comes next needs to be better. Let's take a look at whether it is possible to see changes in our immediate environment. And so that we ourselves can also change. I should note, there are four very specific points in the context in here in the Americas that cannot be ignored when we talk about the rights and the role of the inter-American system, and more particularly, the right to health, which has been directly affected by this health emergency. It is important to emphasize how very, the, the very serious downturn in the economies, which is, which is spreading poverty more widely in the Americas, uh, already the economies in Latin America were weak when the pandemic began. As we see in, in rates of poverty and extreme poverty since 2014, the persistence of inequality and, and widespread discontent. Um, ECLAC expects a 5.3% contraction of the economies in Latin America. There will be 11.1% of new unemployed people and 215 million people will be falling below the poverty line. In this context, there will be a negative impact of the crisis in every in every area of life and which will have an effect on every level. Health, education, employment, social security, access to goods and services and so forth and, and so on and so forth. The sectors that might expect the most serious contractions are trade, uh, health services, social services, which provides 64% of formal employment. This economic recession is having a, a, an especially serious impact on women, as we will see in a moment in order to, we need to address this crisis with public policies for austerity. And, and the application of orthodox austerity measures would affect, would impact not only the quality of life, but also have a disproportionate impact on the lives of those who are most vulnerable. This, what have been the health replications, repercussions? Structural problems in Latin America are clearly revealed in the longstanding shortcomings in healthcare. In 2018, ECLAC said that 8.5 Four percent of the GDP was in, was was being invested in health, much less than the six than, than the ten percent recommended by the World Health Organization. Health systems in Latin America make it impossible to have universal access. In, in most cases, uh, services are fragmented, desegregated, and very disequal. And services of highly varying quality are offered depending on economic status. Another very important factor is the serious dependency that the region has on imported uh, medical equipment and, and inputs. With respect to infrastructure, in 2018, only seven countries of the region had a significantly higher number of hospital beds available per thousand people. Only Barbados, Cuba, St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominica, Argentina, Antigua and Barbuda and Grenada 
were able, exceeded that limit, met, met this, this rate. Also, we must remember that in our region, there was already heavy pressure on our hospital systems be, because of the presence of dengue fever. In 2019, we saw infections of more than 3 million people by deng dengue fever, the highest figure in the history of the region, and more than 1.5 million people died as a result of dengue. Uh, the lack of so the lack of, of effective health care in the region is is a source of great concern then we have the situation of, of food security and nutritional security on the lives of people the right to nutrition by the inter-american court has already been incorporated into the list of enforceable rights and that with, with to, for which people have direct access to this autonomous rights right based on noco hanar argentina case This right cannot be understood in, 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 in isolation. Food security needs to be closely coordinated with all the other rights, such as the right to water, a means of access, and the quality of life. And finally, for the, re the region, for the, when we look at the region, we need to examine the situation of foreign debt and, fin and international financial obligations. Latin America is especially vulnerable to external um, turbulence. It depends on foreign markets. It is highly indebted. It has limited access to finance, financing, and all of these things make it very fragile. Bearing in mind the crisis we're going through, That there's already there was already a, a, a widespread demand for international creditors to uh, amend or to lighten their pressure uh, uh, and to enter into uh, negotiations that are more friendly to the current situation. In fact, some are already requiring renegotiation processes and debt forgiveness. This is the context. Uh, which is arising not only as a, as a result of the pandemic, but it was already present in the region, and it will have an increasingly negative impact in future years. In the framework of, of, this, of, of this situation, the Inter-American Court needs to emphasize that it, the importance of its, of its jurisprudential work uh, over the medium term. This will be a means of access and a bridge, a, light, a bridge, a, a light of hope for the for the thousands and thousands of people who are affected, not, who, who, whose whose right to of access to health care is has been affected not only um, theoretically, but it, but this but this pandemic has has painfully revealed that the health systems and inputs uh, either are not ex available at all or are have are a very poor quality or that lend themselves to acts of corruption. In this context, the court has prov provided the inter-American system with, juice, with, with international juice communes through two very important judgments that grant uh, th 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 a contribution to the development of juice communes at the international level and also provide tools to the general public to make to give life to their right to enjoy rights as a whole in particular the right to health care in these cases who versus guatemala who school privarad guatemala and poblete vilches versus chile the court stated that it recognized the right to health as an autonomous right that was enforceable and that could be demanded directly but also they established minimal standards that should be met in order for the population to have access to a judicial remedies uh, if necessary. What are these standards? Stand, it, it, established, it established standards of quality, accessibility, availability, and acceptability. Quality. Here, the court said that there need that the countries need to have appropriate necessary infrastructure for meeting basic and urgent needs of the population this includes any type of tool or life support and methods uh, and so forth accessibility here facilities goods and services for health emergencies need to be accessible to all persons uh, availability this means that there needs to be there need to be enough facilities goods and services for, for public health care and also comprehensive 
sorts of health programs. Acceptability. Here, the, the facility, health facilities and services need to respect, re respect medical ethics and culturally appropriate standards. It includes a gender perspective as a, a mandatory and also conditions involving the patient's life cycle. In the case of Poblete Vilches against Chile, the Inter-American Court has set out certain factors that, the, that states need to respect for uh, health care for adults. And it said that, it, that, that, it, that, that age discrimination was illegal in the case of health care for, for the elders, for, 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 for the elderly. And it said that health, public and private health facilities, according to the court, and that response, state responsibility could arise by failure to comply with the duty to oversee lending of services to protect the particular good involved. It said possible medical care in institutions that are not do not have the proper facilities and that do not have appropriate infrastructure or hygiene for lending medical care or professionals who do who are not fully qualified for these activities could lead to an overwhelming high, an overwhelmingly higher rate of loss of the right to life or well-being for the patient. So the obligation to supervise and oversee needs to be updated all the time by the state in in public and private health care services. In this judgment, the court gave a judgment that, that clearly applies to the current pandemic, especially the imminent and serious violation of health of rights to health because of the failure to provide intensive treatment in the in, in intensive care units and known as ICUs because of the lack of, avail of, of available beds, a lack of, 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 of health care professionals, lack of ventilators, or the failure to provide the patient with a transfer to some other facility that does have the, 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 the necessary equipment. This is the contribution that the court has made to the region through the legal system so that people can make use of these instruments. As was stated by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, the battle against this pandemic cannot be won if governments refuse to recognize flagrant inequalities that this virus is revealing. So from the human rights perspective, we need to reassert that the principle of freedom from discrimination includes a positive obligation, that is to create conditions of real equality for groups that have been historically left behind or that are at greater risk of suffering from discrimination. To close, I want to point out that it is a cross-cutting requirement of the states to guarantee equal treatment to all people and to adopt positive measures for those who are particularly vulnerable or at risk. In the setting of this pandemic, this would include, first of all, vulnerabilities caused by the all well-known high mortality rates of COVID-19, overweight, diabetes, age, etc., and at the same time, the need to provide protection to groups that have been historically discriminated against, low-resource people, people living in the streets, the elderly, women, uh, indigenous people, LGBTI groups, and so forth. We also need to emphasize that in the region, of course, one of the most vulnerable groups is migrants. This is why our president, Elizabeth Odio, on May 26th, adopted urgent measures uh, they were especially important in the Velez Lord versus Panama case in order to protect the life of people being held in two migrate, mig, mig, um, migrant centers. After this conference, in fact, we will be holding a, a virtual public hearing where we will receive information from the state about measures and responses that the state has adopted, that the state of Panama, given an urgent measure handed down by the president of this court. This is an unprecedented crisis and it requires unprecedented responses. We have, through the traditional media and the social media, we have witnessed images that we could only have imagined in movies on the world wars or local conflicts. Hundreds of thousands of dead in the streets and public parks, uh, 
tombs, common um, graves, crosses, people demanding medication and care, people crying out for care and attention. We must never forget these terrible images that we've been seeing because they lead us to rethink They oblige us, they require that we be highly imaginative and reinvent ourselves. We are bodies of international protection, and we are standing at a crossroads. At this time, in, the, in this dialogue among courts, we, we need to share our achievements and our challenges in, in, the, in order to update and review the ways that we interpret our, our, our work and the hermeneutics that we face in order in response to the challenges of COVID-19 so that we can make a substantive contribution to an expansive approach, an evolutionary approach that is not elitist and it takes a view of all of the rights of persons and of nature. This is a time, a perfect time to, to optimize the rules we have, the procedures we have for, for, for resolving cases so that the responses that we can give as judges and courts will guarantee direct, effective access for victims so in order to protect by hand, their rights by handing down timely, effective judgments to put an end to violations and international crimes and ordering full uh, compensation, guarantees against repetition, and to put an end to impunity by perpetrators because of actions or omissions and do so in the present time now today we're not talking about later uh, five years later down the road or 10 15 years later we always need to take action quickly in on behalf of human beings and nature as this as the focus of attention of, of juice common of human rights thank you Muchísimas gracias. Con esto, uh, with that, so we close the presentation by the judges. And if you allow me, I'll take some minutes only to make a synthesis of the more important and relevant uh, issues that have been put over the table. Uh, this dialogue among the courts started showing how human rights emerged from crisis. President Olio Benito just showed how after the Second World War, human rights uh, emerged as the hope for the present and future generations. This, uh, this crisis was also underlined by Judge Cybert uh, before, and, and it was qualified as a global crisis, as a sanitary crisis, and, and also by President Ore as a public emergency threatening the life of the nation. In any case, as Judge uh, Pasmino uh, stressed just a moment ago, crises have different impact according to the different fields where they are, uh, 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 they have impact. Um, this scenario of crisis uh, is the one in which the main concern for governments and for courts like the human rights courts of our dialogue is how to improve, how to have a more robust right to health while respecting all the other human rights we are entitled to. And in that context, what we have to, to, to take recourse is the provisions in the, in the human rights conventions dealing with derogation from human rights during public emergencies. That has happened for the great majority of Latin American states under Article 27 of the American Convention uh, as a judge as Cyber 4 showed, only 10 of the 47 member states of the Council of Europe decided to go that way under Article 15 of the European Convention. And as President Ore uh, stressed, uh, there is no derogation provision in the African system. However, the jurisprudence he mentioned showed coincidence with the four principles put forward by President Spano, and that I will remind you. The first, proportionality between public interest and the autonomy of the person. The second, legality and the rule of law in that the measures adopted by governments should be accessible and foreseeable. Third, not to leave too much discretion to executive branches in government. And fourth, that emergency laws should be tailored to meet the exigencies of the situation. In all this panorama, Economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights have been stressed. There is a need for the respect, for the more robust respect of these rights during the pandemic. Um, 
there is also there is also a, a stress in the international cooperation that is needed for this situation to be overcome and for the uh, multilateralism approach. And I think this dialogue is very telling about the importance, the increasing importance of international human rights law in our everyday life as citizens and how it is important that the three existing courts of human rights are together in the same effort. And at the end of the day, they are just uh, uh, sharing the same approaches. The three courts have stressed the need to pay attention to more affected groups like women, like LGBT+, plus, like people in prison. And in the three continents, I guess, there, there have been at least uh, an increase in, in the gender violence and uh, child abuse. Uh, I should add there that it is also important to have women in the decision-making process. And sometimes things don't go very well because we are not there taking the decisions. And um, I think that um, the way in which the three courts have come to us uh, in this event is, is very reassuring uh, on how much we have advanced in human rights and how well this uh, uh, pandemic has found us in the, from the human rights perspective. Uh, but of course, as usual, this is an everyday construction and we have to, to keep a, a guard on that. I would like to thank the three courts for trusting me to be the moderator of this event. I feel very much privileged for being here with you. And I also want to convey the message that uh, the presentations of this event will be published in three languages. English, French, and Spanish. So everybody will have to, the possibility of choosing the more comfortable uh, uh, language. Many, many thanks to all the participants, the three presidents, the four judges that are uh, with us today. And thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you very much to everybody. Bye-bye.